Welcome to this super high tech multimedia event. I have no idea what's going on, but I hope it's working. Um, welcome to the launch of Gender Network Sky Syzygy. Did I do it? You did I it. Did it. <laughs> um, my name is Greg Newton. My partner is Donnie Jokum. We are the co founders of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, which is the room you find yourself in right now. Uh, the Bureau is, we like to say, a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. And the service we provide is holding this space for queer books and queer culture. Um, so we are a 10 year old all volunteer organization. Uh, we've been here at the center since 2014. And we have regular bookstore hours Wednesdays through Sundays from 1 to 7 p.m. And then we do lots of events, sometimes during store hours and sometimes in the evening. And if you'd like to be on our email list to find out about future events, you can sign up for that at the register and you'll get an email every other Monday about our many upcoming events. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn it over to Sky now and we will leap into the future <laughs> <laughs> and the past. <laughs> Please give a warm welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm, I'm trying to juggle the real and the virtual worlds right now. So um, bear with me as I try to figure this out. So if you're in the real room and you're having a hard time hearing me or seeing anything or things look weird, um, you don't have to chat. You can just say it out loud. <laughs> um, but if you're on Zoom, um, please chat or um, I guess come off mute if things are really going bad uh, and um, we should be able to hear you in the room. We'll figure all of this out as we go into like a Q&A section later, um, but just want to say welcome everybody. Um, thank you so, so much for being here. This is so exciting. Um, this is uh, uh, the soft launch of gender.network. Um, soft because um, it's an expanding project, expanding archive of ephemera. Um, and also soft because um, this only works in relationship. Um, this is all about relationship to community. And so hearing from all of you is extremely important to not only to me, but I think to the future of this project and of writing our history together. Um, so I don't know that the world will ever really be a hard launch. Uh, So uh, I thought this would be a funny slide to start with. Um, I really, I do really want to thank each and every one of you for being here because, as I said, this project really um, relies on, depends on, and grows out of a desire to have a, a deeper, more authentic, more um, uh, less reductive relationship with trans community and trans history. Um, and so. This is also to say thank you to the many activists and artists whose work shows up in this archive, um, who have paved the way for all of us to even be here today. Um, and also to the incredible scholars and authors and researchers who have done so much work already in unpacking this history and narrating its many facets and trajectories and forms and formats. Um, and then to the incredible archivists who have done and collectors um, who have done the work of, I've been going to physical archives and taking photos of things. And that's only been possible because somebody has collected that and thought to, to uh, tag it in some way or put it in a box somewhere next to something else that it makes it possible to find it. And that um, that work I think is really incredibly important. Um, and then I also wanna thank all of the elders, the foremothers, forefathers, foreparents um, who have spent so much time doing oral histories, uh, writing their memoirs, creating blogs, have left traces of themselves in archives, have done a lot of this collecting themselves and have spent hours on the phone with me <laughs> telling me stories. Um, and I, I hope there will be more of that, but um, none of this is exists without all of this work together. So that's where I wanted to start with this. Thank you um, to the trans um, 
community at large, historical present, and to all of the people who aren't um, who, who aren't with us anymore. So this is um, maybe a moment to of gratitude and also of memory of remembering all the people who are not with us. I've got more gratitude. Um, these are more institutional um, to Christian and Roxana and all of AIR Gallery that has been really incredible in providing um, administrative support, helping fundraising, moral support. It's been incredible to um, Che Gossett, Finn Eng, Jean Vakara, Malcolm Shanks, and Susan Stryker, who were an advisory committee and really helped get this project um, off the ground at all to Ritu, uh, who is the web designer that we'll look at the website later and none of this would exist in public form without her work. And then this is a list of some of the many people that I've spoken with and I, I hope there will be more, but um, again, this project is really about for, from, through these voices. Um, I also want to thank the funders. Um, I'm required to, but also I, uh, it's so important. Um, the website also would not exist. The advisory committee also would not exist. Um, none of this would, would exist without their generosity. NISCA, Humanities New York, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, and the Puffin Foundation. Um, and then I also want to um, thank the land that we're on um, and the people whose traditional homeland that this is, the Muncie Lenape people. And I, I say this not only because there's no vision of justice, we're talking about gender liberation right now. There's no vision of liberation that's complete without um, a, a vision of returning land and resources and sovereignty to the people who it is rightfully theirs. Um, but also because particularly when we're talking about gender liberation, um, the history of uh, colonial violence in, is deeply connected and has been justified based on um, understandings of gender and race that are deeply interconnected. So we can't really talk about gender liberation without also at the same time talking about uh, hundreds of years of colonial violence on this continent. Um, so, and also, um, that that fact has not gone unnoticed by gender trans gender liberation organizers and activists over the last 50 years indigenous understandings of gender appear throughout the archive and that's something we'll talk about a little bit later um but so i uh, there's also a tremendous amount of gratitude to the work of indigenous activists who have really paved the way in thinking decolonial gender and um thinking about how um, indigenous sovereignty is is part and parcel of this work. Okay, so um, gender network. What 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 is this? Um, this is the blurb that you've all seen because it was uh, the blurb we used for talking about this project. And I just kind of want to break it down a little bit. Um, so this is a collection of ephemera, flyers, photos, artwork, cartoons, letters, poems, manuscripts, books, notes, all sorts of things that um, appear in archives, but also in people's personal collections. Um, there's some multimedia, That's there's some um, sound work, there's some film also. Um, so this is all, I'm not an archivist by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a visual artist. And so it's also, I think just, it's a personal, my personal role in this project is, is I'm thinking of this visually and trying to understand, because I feel like it's such an amazing way to encapsulate and understand a time and uh, the people who are moving through it by the, the things, the visual world that they're moving through and creating. So um, also there's a bit of a time period and geographic. Um, some of this is convenience um, in that I'm an English speaker and I live in North America. So North American archives are much easier to access. Um, 60s to 90s seems really important right now because there are, so, there are people, many people, I don't wanna say there are people, many people remember this time. Um, and that's not gonna be true for 
forever. So this feels like a really key moment to be archiving and understanding this particular period. Um, but there are some things in this archive already that are from the 50s, some things from the early 2000s, and these all of these boundaries are a little bit soft. Um, another thing that's important is that this is um, about trans expansively, trans two-spirit, non-binary, and gender liberation, trans adjacent. Um, these terms have shifted meanings. These terms are constantly changing and have uh, people have different access to them. And also within particular cultural, um, subcultural worlds, these terms are valuable or not. So um, I'm thinking of this softly also. Um, but really looking at examples of activism, organizers and artists, which again are kind of mixed up and it's not clear where one thing ends and the other begins. Um, but I think the most important part is this word by, because I'm really looking for examples of trans adjacent trans big, the big trans um, people who are um, creating, who are speaking, who are representing themselves. And if they're not, if it is um, someone else's, you know, creation that they had a big role in determining big, a lot of agency in determining how they are being represented. Because so often I feel like in trans history and in representations of transness and trans people, um, it is always, it's often somebody else who's has that control. Um, there's a lot of exploitation. There's um, in the archive, there is a ton of trans exploitation porn. Um, surprisingly, um, in university archives, I was surprised to see quite how much there is. But so I, this is something that um, I really want to work against and, and find these moments where um, people are, trans people are talking and working on and thinking about um, gender and liberation. Um, and I said that was the most important, but actually, as I said at the beginning, the most important thing here is that um, this is a, um, an archive that we can build and shape together. Um, and um, yeah, so as part of today's presentation conversation, I would love to hear from you if you have suggestions or feedback, things that should be included, things that are missing, places to look. Um, and this is something that I'm going to be continuing to do this year is on um, trying to hold more events around, actually, as I travel around to, go to archives to talk to people. Um, so even thoughts about that, like um, places to go, groups that already exist um, for convening, things like that. And then maybe the last um, note here is that at least right now it exists as an online archive. Um, at the end of next year, it will move into, um, I have a period of time to print some books, hand making books, which I'm super excited about because the coming back to that first idea of like flyers and photos, there's something about the physical aspect of this, the, the pieces of paper that things were printed on. This is all, the 60s to 90s is also important because it's pre-internet. Um, so newspapers, newsletters, there's a lot of this um, organizing is happening by mail. Um, so anyway, there's a, there's a physical book version of this that's going to exist in a very, very, very short run um, because I have to make them all myself um, uh, at the end of next year. Um, so that's like a landing point, but that's, I, if I have any say in this, that is not the end. That is just another stop on this journey. Um, okay, is this really the next slide? Yes, it is. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> So then this is one last thought before we actually look at the archive um, is about geography. Um, so these are, uh, these are, this is a Google map of a bunch of the archives that I know of that have important queer history materials in them. Um, there's quite a few in the San Francisco and LA areas, quite a few in, um, New York, there's also Yale and Harvard and Cornell and you know other university libraries. 
But I, I, I bring this, I put this up here to say that one of the really important aspects of this project is to try to work, also work against the, the New York, San Francisco poles of this history. Um, I spent some time at the Treader Collection in Minneapolis, and there's some amazing stuff there. I've been finding really interesting things about, which I'll show you some of, about Pacific Northwest, um, and also um, Milwaukee and Iowa. Um, there's some really amazing history in Atlanta. So, and then I think I, I, I put this here to say that there's a huge part of the country where, that I don't even know where to look for the history of um, trans gender liberation in the Southwest um, or not so much in the Midwest. So I think that's, that's one aspect of, um, of trying to work against a certain bias in the archive. Another is um, it's, it's generally more challenging, I found, to find examples of trans masculine organizing um, and uh, trans of color organizing. These are sort of harder to, to find, harder to locate these materials in the physical archives that I have been to or that I know of. So um, geography and um, gender and race are all things that um, I really want to kind of push against in this project. Okay. So let's look at the archive and let's hope that it actually opens because <laughs> it was a countdown timer if you anybody any of you tried to visit it before um but i think i got yes okay great it is live um so what to say about this um there's already quite a bit of material here um and it's organized very horizontally. So um, the, there is some ability to filter by geography, um, by group or someone's name, by the type of material that's represented and very roughly by decade, by time period. But we have intentionally not included any of the usual kind of um, structures that would be attempting to classify based on identity, based on gender, um, with the intention that, in fact, this the, the, the work of the people that is represented here is really has in many ways pushing against that, um, or is articulating it in ways that I don't think um, we necessarily have in the like archive science world, like have language for. So the way that um, we're trying to organize it then is each one of these items, some of them have multiple pages. For example, this is um, the Third World Gay Revolution Manifesto is printed in this pamphlet in 1970. Um, there's a list of items that are sort of adjacent to this in terms of similarity of geography and content. Um, and so we're, we're kind of going for this horizontal motion through the archive as opposed to um, saying like putting hard boundaries around things. So that's also a kind of softness that we're really trying to go for. Um, And yeah, <laughs> uh, the idea really being about um, encountering things by surprise. Um, so this homepage also has just a few, you can jump into that and find your way into to new things. So um, I don't wanna say too much more, I think about the, the overall archive but instead take a few trips through some materials that I feel are really interesting um, and kind of a few speculative journeys through um, what we found so far. 
So yeah, so I've grouped these three types and one just sort of um, across, you'll, it'll, you'll understand it as we get to it. Um, so there's quite a bit of poetry in the archive in ways that I, um, in lots of different ways, in lots of different forms. Um, so this is a lyric sheet slash advertisement slash poem by Johnny Science, um, who is a trans man rock band performer. Um, and I have this really great poem called You and Me Androgyny. I'm not sure what the tune is that this goes to. Um, it does have the wonderful chorus, you and me androgyny, yeah. <laughs> um, does anybody want to read this? Should we do that? Maybe not. Uh, like, you don't want to. I don't, yeah. We can read, can everybody see? Yeah, can everybody, is everybody, Able to read it? Maybe I'll just read instrumental passage. No. Um, <laughs> uh, there's some there's some audio in a second, so I I feel like um, I'm not sure. I wonder, can everybody on Zoom read this? Okay. Um, can you can see it fine. What's that? We can read it together. All right. Um, all right, I'm just gonna read it. Uh, <laughs> we are stood like bricks and mortar, held so fast by gravity, told we're right, then sent asunder, radioactivity. You and me, androgyny, yeah. <laughs> I touch, you touch, hardly, softly. We don't care what people think. We know why we are a symbol of the life beyond the brink. You and me, androgyny, yeah. <laughs> Are we rich or are we poor? What's the difference anyway? We've got no credit rating. We're expending energy. You and me. I love it. Um, I found this book by, uh, this is another trans man, Hap Hanchett, um, poems called Guilty by Gender. I, this um this I wanted to do another one of these journeys of all the symbols. Um, this yin and yang symbol appears in so many publications and across so many different eras. It's a really interesting um, part of this. Um, they so they have this really lovely poem called Authenticity. I gravitate to women who are strong and men who are soft. I am drawn to identity without role. And then this is um this is an audio poem by it's kind of spoken word. I believe it's Dorian Corey. Um I'll just play it, I'll just play a little bit of it. This is um I feel that we all live in a world that is full of hardship, it's full of misery, but it's a beautiful world. And all you've got to do is just accept yourself. I feel that you've got to wake up and be able to say, regardless of what anyone else thinks about me, I know that what I do is good for me. Regardless of what you think of what you say. You say you don't like this, and you can't stand that. Well, most folks don't even like the neighbor living in their next door flat. 
You say the woman is funny. And God knows the man is queer. But have you ever sat back just one time and dug yourselves, my dear? You sniggle and giggle at what you see other folks do. But don't you know that somewhere someone is laughing at you too? Can you truthfully say that since you were 10 years old, that there's nothing you've done that you'd be ashamed to have told. Well, not I. For you see, I've been down with myself a long, long time. Ever since the day I was born, that's when my mother wanted a little girl. And my father, my father, a bouncing baby boy. So they put their heads together and they tried and tried and tried. And you guessed it, folks. They both were satisfied. That's why I'm happy. Say. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it, it goes on quite a long time. There's, um, I, yeah, I, rec I highly recommend that uh, recording. Um, here's a, another one. This is um, by Jackie Curtis. It's called The Star. I don't, are you familiar? So I should maybe pause and say Dorian Corey is a, does everybody know Dorian Corey? No, Dorian Corey is a um, drag performer um, from the late 60s, early 70s, um, both in like um, West Side uh, downtown drag clubs and the Holland Ball scene. Um, Jackie Curtis is a, she was one of Andy Warhol's muses, um, but she's also a, a really amazing poet and playwright. Um, and so this, I, I feel like is reflecting a little bit on her, her fame. Um, the star is ideally beautiful. The star is pure. The star is profoundly good. Beauty and spirituality combine to form a mythic super personality. Worshipped as heroes, divinized. The stars are more than objects of admiration. A, re oops. a religion in embryo has formed around them. The star is like a patron saint to whom the faithful dedicate themselves. Will there ever be words for the vicissitudes of the milk and suffering of the mouth? This, I, this I am describing as a poem because that's the best I know how. Um, this is a, uh, from a two-spirit activist, um, Angu Kusar, um, also goes by Richard La Fortune. Um, and this I found in his papers in uh, Minneapolis. Um, I love this thing so much. I used to be a, um, well, I used to be a scientist. So maybe maybe this is just my like math geekiness coming through. Um, new math, anatomy doesn't equal gender. Gender squared equals top parentheses bottom over the moments. <laughs> F of male equals brackets, female times male plus male times female over pi absent father squared. <laughs> and then my favorite, normal equals F U. Um, this is a group that I know very little about. Um, I know they're from Milwaukee. Uh, they seem to be an offshoot of radical queens. They call themselves the Les Petites Bonbons. Um, and um, yeah, I don't really know much more to say. They have all of these quotes um, on this page up from, it, it seemed to be like almost Dadaist a little bit. Um, they have Tristan Zara and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what to say about them. Les Petits Bonbons are con con constantly changing, constantly recreating 
We are children at play who have refused the limitations of adulthood and who have rejected cultural manhood at a time when the ma that manhood is clearly the equivalent of death. Um, I thought it was also interesting that they quote Germaine Greer, who is um, like a anti-trans person at this point. So this is one of the, well, this is one of the many questions in this um, archive. Um, in Radical Fairies Digest, uh, there's this poem by Asada Saint, who's um, also a performance artist here in New York, or was a performance artist in New York. Um, in the name of America, beyond masks, ancestors wore, bore, though thoughts too often misspeak brutally on this land of unsettled promises. Rise against an horizon where labels beacon you with Vikings' tales. Sired in the snows of Sunsval, I brick dark from the country of Loas coconuts to Saint. Keys, chains, hankies hang out of your pockets, pearls from my ear, trusting togetherness, your voice of fugues, my pen, which paints heaven in hell, across barriers, states, borders, frontiersmen, bearing sexuality as talisman, we care them. Um, then next is a little section from Dark Testament by Polly Murray. Um, familiar with Polly Murray? They were an um, amazing legal scholar and um, activist who struggled, questioned their gender. And um, this was there from there. This is an example from the 50s. Um, it is the end of the poem. Then let the dream linger on. Let it be the test of nations. Let it be the quest of all our days, the fevered pounding of our blood, the measure of our souls, that none shall rest in any land and none return to dreamless sleep. No heart be quieted, no tongue be stilled, until the final man may stand in any place and thrust his shoulders to the sky, friend and brother to every other man. Um, this last piece is um, also something that feels a little hard to categorize. Dee Farmer is the, was the first trans person to um, testify in front of the Supreme Court. Um, she's a prison rights advocate um, after being incarcerated herself and her case in front of the Supreme Court was very much about fighting for um, prisoners' rights. And this is a, she was also very involved in AIDS activism. And this is a, a little pamphlet um, that is sort of a, a poem to people with AIDS, particularly prisoners with AIDS, um, which I found really touching and beautiful. It's too long to, to read. So I'm just gonna end with this. Um, and then, What's interesting is as we, as I go through this, maybe, let me see what time it is. I feel like I'm talking much more slowly than I want to. Um, I'm just gonna jump to the, oh, but there's so many good things. <laughs> I'm gonna go real fast. Um, Idol Sheet is a, this is a, a news, newsletter that um, was produced for the Harlem Harlem Ball scene in the 1980s by Marcel Christian. It is an amazing, I am totally obsessed with this. Um, there's Dorian Corey. And I think the one thing that comes up is that this is why I'm calling it a network is because everything is, people are appearing in multiple places. Um, there are so many connections that I feel like um, I want to understand more or just, it's amazing to see them. So this is, um, 
for a bulb produced by Dorian Corey in Pepper Lupasia. Um, it has a poem. It has, this one's amazing. It, it has all of these imaginary ball houses. And this is why it's here in cartoons. It has this incredible chart of all of the houses with a color, a secret skill, and um, a drawing, a cartoon for each of them. This is, and it's, Marcel says this is completely imaginary. This is just a um, kind of an offering to the ball scene. Um, these are drawings that I found in Stormy Delivery's papers that I believe Stormy drew, um, uh, including this one that I think is a self portrait or a portrait of Stormy called the Health Sisters. I don't know who the other person is. Um, Moon Shadow is a publication by the Transsexual Action Organization, um, which has these incredible cover art and art throughout it. Um, so bleep, 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 come in Venus, come in Venus. We should have no trouble taking over here. I've been living with one of them for two years. They're pathetic. This planet will soon be ours. Is I think encapsulates sort of the, the mindset of Tao. Um, here's another cover. Um, very trans futurist. I don't know. Uh, here's a cartoon that appeared. This is a syndicated cartoon that appeared in New York Native. I don't know actually what syndicated means. This is a regular cartoon that appeared in New York Native in 1981, featuring World Arena. This is this is one rare example I think of something that was not created um, by a trans person, but who were, you know, uh, but who. Uh, clearly had a lot of um, role in what content was here. Um, Transsexuals in Prison is a publication that Dee Farmer was associated with. Um, so she wrote a lot of essays for it. And these issues which were distributed for free to transsexuals in prison um, has, is full of all of these really kind of raunchy cartoons um, by an artist uh, Yuri Kirikov, who I don't know anything about, um, but um, mm -hmm. another sort of opening, it feels like, to something that I, I wonder about. Um, here's a cartoon, I was a teenage boy, uh, by Johanna, or Johanna, um, and uh, Brad Attack, um, around 1993. Um, this publication also has some really amazing <laughs> trans cartoons. Um, and this is one of my favorites, 500 Reasons Why South Asian Butchers Are So Very Rare by Sir Gitley, who's a trans man in Canada. Um, I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> um, all right, I wanna do one, one more of these and then we'll turn it over. Manifesto, there's a lot of really amazing manifestos uh, um, and they open up to a lot of questions. But I, I, this one is a sort of cross journey where I'm, I'm trying to reference these connections that seem to appear, um, which I feel like suggest possibilities that I don't know what to do with. So Drag Magazine, um, this is the very first issue um, published in 1971, um, published here in New York by Lee Brewster. Um, and the early issues were very political, um, dealing with a lot of protests, um, as well as drag performances. Um, but I noticed on the last page, there is a, an advertisement um, by the latter, which was a major, the major lesbian publication at the time, which was published in San Francisco. So 1971, there is some sort of connection happening between San Francisco lesbian activists and drag, transvestite, transsexual activism in New York City. That to me is really interesting. Um, then in uh, Barbara Giddings papers here in the New York Public Library, there's a bunch of correspondence between Barbara Giddings who is a lesbian activist um, in New York um, and San, originally in San Francisco. Um, there's a bunch of these essays that were written by um, 
people who were Sheila Niles um, and some other people who were writing for Transvestia, which was an early transvestite publication. This is 1965, writing essays for the latter. And Sheila Niles um, uh, is from New Jersey. So already in 1965, there's some sort of like cross. Um, this is Sheila writing, this is at the bottom of that. She's writing to Barbara. Um, so super interesting to me um, because it goes against the sort of general understanding, I think, of lesbian versus trans history, particularly in San Francisco, particularly in 1973, when there's a very public confrontation that happens at the West Coast Lesbian Conference. Here is an example, um, which I you know, know about from scholarly work and whatever, but I had never read until doing this work. Um, Beth Elliott, who is the trans woman who was a co-organizer of the conference, um, her response, which is actually quite, um, uh, it's very poetic. I don't know how else to say it. It's, um, and she's really sort of referencing the connections that she feels to this community. Um, so that's 1973. Um, another interesting thing that kind of weaves through this is, so the person who kind of gave the confrontational speech at this conference, Robin Morgan, her husband was kind of Pritchford, Pitchford, um, who was a founding member of this um, the feminist group. So there's this, um, all of this work on, I don't know what to call it exactly. There's some strain of it that is about men's liberation, but there's also something that's about androgyny and anti-sexism. Um, so this is one of their, they were based here in New York um, and published a lot of essays and manifestos about feminism and what it means and how to work against sort of patriarchal bias as a, um, as a man. Um, so that's 1970, proposal for the founding of the Flaming Faggots. Um, that was another kind of a moniker they used. 1980, this one, uh, androgyny newsletter, there was some kind of group in California that I really want to know more about um, that was all about men. They have this, um, men, will you wear the skirts spelled S-K-E-R-T-S in your family? Um, all about like working against male privilege in certain kind of performative ways. Um, I really, it feels a little bit cultish, but um, <laughs> it's so so interesting also that this is, it's also happening around the time that androgyny is um, becoming very popular within feminist criticism. Um, oh, there was a chat. Oh, um, Okay, I'm getting some comments. Um, thank, thank you for the comments. Unfortunately, I can't see them while I'm doing this, um, but I, so uh, someone on Zoom is talking about the connections between the feminist movement and yes, uh, they're saying that the feminist movement was explicitly anti-trans. Yeah, it was, it, or at least very anti-drag, um, saying that like that was um, mocking women. Um, this uh, here's again that yin yang symbol. Um, this is from 1975. Uh, I believe actually, I found it in Milo Guthrie's papers. Um, I believe Milo was connected with the radical fairies and. Um, I think this is actually their their group or a group that they were closely involved with, but I love this. And the fact that the axolotl, which is this little amphibious creature or aquatic creature, um, is their symbol. And there's and Milo has written a whole essay about why the axolotl is their symbol of androgynous communism. Um, I think it's really fantastic. Um, I mentioned radical fairies. Um, uh, oh, I thought I had put it in here. Oh, that's right. We, we already looked at it, the Asada Saint piece. Um, Will Roscoe is a, an author who's published recently about 
um, and this is also kind of a critique within the radical fairies about um, the kind of return to the land movement and how it was appropriating from um, indigenous traditions. Um, and as an example, that this idea of burdash, which is a, a kind of outdated word for referring to two-spirit people, um, it, it's here in a radical fairies paper, but it's also, we, I find it in all kinds of queer publications. However, in 1980, in Portland, Oregon, there is a, a group called the Intertribal Burdash Society. That is, as far as I can tell, actually a pre, two-spirit doesn't become a word until the 90s. So this is a very early queer activist group um, within indigenous community in Portland that um, I would love to know more about. Also, that same year, there is a group um, uh, of indigenous women and women of color who are creating space for themselves um, and articulating as an explicitly um, indigenous and of color space and also um, very feminist. There's a lot of talk in here about what to do with male children um, and how, how to raise them or, you know, um, dealing with patriarchy. Um, so these are movements that I know very little about, but I'm very excited to learn more about. Um, this is something from Minneapolis. Here's another, this is the, the first, um, what later became the International Two-Spirit uh, Conference that happens every year. Um, it was originally called Basket and Bow, um, which I think speaks to the kind of gendered um, aspect of it. Um, the, the organizers were then formed a, a group here in New York City called Wewa and Barchi Ampi, which actually led the Gay Pride Parade in 1991 um, after some conflict. Um, they led the parade in 1991, but they were not allowed to be in front of the dikes on bikes. Um, oh, this is their publication from 1992. Um, so there's some really interesting literature on this group and um, they were also very connected with AIDS activism. Um, so I bring this in because this has a little article on dikes on bikes. My comrade is a really great zine, um, which I think is available here. Right now. Oh, okay, uh, by Linda Simpson. Um, who, yeah, so there's this article on Dykes on Bikes, that's why I brought it in here. And then also in that same issue, there is an article about RuPaul, who was just queened, uh, queen, queen of Manhattan. Um, and then I found this amazing article in Tricon, um, uh, which is a Southeast Asian publication, queer publication, um, which actually has quite a bit about transness and drag and this features uh, an interview between this um, Southeast Asian drag queen and RuPaul. Um, and also in that, that same issue, a, a trans man of color writing about um, how great it is that transness is being discussed in this Southeast Asian publication. Um, and then I don't know, then I, I made a little bit of a leap um, because I really wanted to include it. Jameson Green um, sent me this um, really lovely short story um, because they are so often known for their work in um, uh, kind of legal and medical activism for trans people, um, which brings me back to Dee Farmer and uh, her appearing in front of the Supreme Court. Um, from what I can tell, she actually authored um, a lot of this, um, her, the opinion, or not the opinion, the like, whatever that is, the filing to the Supreme Court. Um, and then I just wanted to end with, oh, this is more, um, an, another really interesting trans of color prison activist group from 1980 um, called uh, Men Against Sexism. And then I just wanted to end with this photo um, from 1973 of, uh, Marsha P. Johnson with this banner that called Gay Poor People, which I feel like sums up 
the connections that I feel like are going on in this archive between transness and um, all other kinds of organizing, intersectional solidarity, um, and also conflict. Uh, so that is a slice through the archive. I am going to stop talking now. Um, And like I said at the beginning, I would really love to hear your thoughts. I would love any questions um, and suggestions. And um, to do this, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to... do this. So um, thank you all so much. I also want to put, give a shout out at eight o'clock, there is a dance performance happening here in this building uh, by a uh, non-binary choreographer from in Philadelphia. That was really amazing. So if that's something that's exciting to you, please don't feel um, any hard feelings if you want to run to that. <laughs> uh, but if not, I would just love to hear from you. So if you are on Zoom, please um, raise your hand and I will call for you, call on you. And if you're in the room, raise your hand and I will. <laughs> Yes. Hey, um, great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, I, so my name is Amicia, and I think this is a beautiful archive of a collection of, of history for a very specific time period of that reflects like, sexual revolution, queer culture, queer culture, and black era. Is there anything that exists that predates that that is already existing right now? And do you know anything like that over the future of to see? Like how it's influenced over time. That, that what? Sorry, I didn't know that predates the 1960s. Oh, like I see. Like I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, Lee Devon has done some amazing work. Lee is right here in the front. Um, on, um, well, maybe you want to say, uh, like up to the Renaissance. Era, but particularly in the European tradition. There's a lot of work on prehistory, prehistory work um, and the gender. Maybe you want to say more about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad you question. I think like, there's so much interest in trans history um, and going back before the 1960s. This is such a wonderful subject. There's so many great oral history puppets also that. Um, you try to talk to them, and there's so many people um, because before we were trans book, right there, it's really so many. <laughs> it was really excellent. Um, there are just a whole bunch of like new books that have just recently come out. I feel like it's such an exciting time for trans history. That's my book, which is really early. Um, also, Susan Stryker has a brand new book that's going to be coming out that goes from colonial America to today. So, yeah. I think that we'll just have a lot more material to be able to teach with and, and learn from. Um, and I think that these online projects are such a great way to get people interested as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you're not being on Zoom. Can you give me a thumbs up? Yeah. <laughs> Is this better? Oh, that's better for me, but maybe not for, all right. Um, we'll just do them, we'll just pass the mic around. Other questions or thoughts? Yes? Um, so you have mentioned that the, that the items items in the gender network are kind of categorized not hierarchically or kind of with like less data almost so that it's meant to kind of be like bruised and browsed and like stumbled upon. 
Um, so I guess with that, how do you see it being used in a way that's different that may be um, more uh, rigorous or academic or meditating out or maybe you're going in already knowing what you want to buy? Um, did you all hear that okay? No. no, I think that's a no. Just okay, so the question is, um, with this more horizontal, non-hierarchical archive, um, how is it, how am I imagining it being useful? Yeah, or who or where? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not thinking of it because it's, at the moment, so so much of it is borrowing from existing archives where that metadata already exists. Um, to a certain extent, that there is some of that. Like I have the archive listed, and so you could go and locate it yourself if you wanted to. Um, but this is about mining those existing archives for very specific pieces, because in that you know one box, there's one folder with one sheet for the androgynous communism, for example, that's one thing in a million within a, a larger collection. So I think some of it is just locating things that are up, that I, I think are of interest and trying to group them to, together. Um, and then I think for me, I'm really interested in this as a, a way of kind of doing what I think that these activists are asking for, which is thinking differently about these categories and working against them and across them in ways that um, I don't know that are possible. I feel like that the archive is already colonized in so many ways. And so, yeah, so um, I'm hoping that it's a discovery that, I hate that's maybe a bad word since I'm talking about <laughs> like a like a like inspiration. I don't know. There's something about it that that feels. I feel this sense of magic when I'm in the archive and I see something and I'm like, I had no idea this was here. I didn't know this person was connected to that. Oh my god! Like here's that name. That's something that so and so told me about, and I I want to try to offer that back to people who are engaging with this archive to the extent, you know, as a digital thing or one day in printed form or how, whatever other forms this takes, um, that feels really important to me. So yeah, I don't think it's a, maybe it's a research tool. Maybe it's a, it's a, but I think it's not in the way that maybe we're accustomed to and that, I would feel really good if it <laughs> didn't work that way. Yes. Um, maybe at the right. Hi, can you hear me, Zoom? <laughs> um, okay, so maybe uh, as a follow up to that question, you could talk a little bit about either or both, if at all, the connections uh, between the archive and the forthcoming book that you have yet to create. Um, or more oh, yeah. broadly construed the connections between this archive and your research and art and artistic practice. And a question? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll take, I'll choose the first one. Um, uh, so this coming here, this is right. So this is a launch, but not an end. Um, and I'm, really hoping to spend a lot of time in more archives, bringing in more materials, talking to more people, um, and really trying to cite these conversations within particular geographies and um, getting elders together. I don't, there are, you know, whatever, um, working with community that already exists in some ways to hear more do something not quite an oral, maybe it's an oral history, something where people are giving commentary about what's in here. So using this as an inspiration for people to say, oh yeah, I remember such and such. And um, my hope is to be able to include that as actually as part of this so that we're getting kind of 
um, an audio guide, and also using all of those conversations to distill what is now, I, it's like 300 items, probably a thousand pictures because each of them has multiple pages into something that can actually be assembled. And what I didn't say, and it's in the it's in the blurb, I think, but um, a real major inspiration conceptually and visually for this project is Toni Morrison's The Black Book, which is this incredible collection of ephemera. Um, her, her book spans 400 years of um, pre-colonialism through slavery up to her present day of um, Black history, um, patents and arts and crafts and newspaper articles and laws and all sorts of things. So um, this is a much smaller um, archive, but my, my thinking is, so these conversations are about distilling this and having people help to decide, help to clarify what things are most important, what things are most salient, what things uh, need to run up against each other. Um, part of what's so amazing about her book is the way that she aligns, puts things next to each other that are in deep conflict with each other. Um, and that's something that feels, like I was saying, the Le Petit Bonbon with the Germain Greer quote, or this, um, or the really beautiful aspect of Drag Magazine with a ladder, um, uh, Advertisement. Advertisement. There's also, we didn't do the manifestos, but there's this incredible synchronicity that's going on. Synchronicity, it's the wrong word. There's, there's clearly collaboration going on between a few trans activist groups and the third world gay revolution who are all using similar text to refer to trans, to talk about, to, to declare to the need for trans liberation. Um, and there's even some, you know, they're talking about how they're working together and they're going to hold a conference. Some of that feels really incredible because these things are, you know, sort of reoccurring over and over again. And it evidences the way that people are working with each other. Um, but I, I think we only know this by hearing from other people what was actually going on or what, you know, what, what they remember at the time. Um, that answer your question? Yes, sir. sort of. Okay, cool. Anybody on Zoom want to? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else in the room? Okay, well. This was lovely. Oh, yes. Um, I wanted to put out like a sign up sheet in case um, you want to be in touch because I will do more of these things, hopefully in other cities, hopefully hybrid. Um, hopefully, I'll, the tech will become more seamless. <laughs> uh, I hope people on Zoom were able to hear most of this. Um, so yeah, I'll pass around a, a little sign up sheet and um, and we can reach out online too. Right? And you can reach out online and now there's a website. <laughs> so I would love to hear your thoughts about what you find on there, what seems interesting, what's missing, um, I think is the biggest question. And um, yeah, thanks for joining. Uh, thank you so much. Continuing. So please hang out, check out the books on Top to Sky about this project. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.